everybody. This is for my U.S. History 2 students. Um, still talking about World War I, uh, looking at Concept 3, um, the use of propaganda and the suspension of civil liberties. So in many ways, this, this um, part of the essay is quite disturbing because it, um, in order for Americans to get on board with this war, uh, the use of propaganda was um, absolutely necessary, um, as it is in most wars that are successful. Um, and in tandem with the propaganda, many people were imprisoned for their um, for for disagreeing publicly uh, against the war, in in, in many um, in many respects. So, um, what what is propaganda? Just to make sure everyone understands what propaganda is. Propaganda is just the use of um, information. Um, to, to persuade people to either act or not act on any given issue or action. Um, and usually uh, you're u utilizing information to appeal to people's fears, right? So we see this all the time in advertisements, right? Advertisers will make you feel, or at least attempt to uh, make you feel inadequate for not using their product. So you won't be strong enough, sexy enough, smart enough, unless you brush your teeth with this particular toothpaste. Um, uh, we, you definitely will see propaganda within um, uh, the political campaign, right, uh, that's heading up. So 45 days till Election Day. Um, so make sure you're registered to vote and you get out there and avoid looking at all the propaganda. Propaganda's information is usually void of specifics. Uh, it could be an outright lie propaganda, or it just could be skirting the truth a little bit, a little bit of half-truth, right? Uh, it's usually, um, th there's usually a lot of uh, use of imagery with propaganda, again, to appeal to people's um, emotions. And usually that emotion that they're appealing to is fear. The fear is a base uh, emotion, right? Before we, when we usually experience a series of negative emotions, like anger and sadness or whatever the case may be, or jealousy, uh, the first emotion that one felt was fear. So before you get angry at somebody, you usually are scared, and then you get angry, or you get sad, or whatever the case may be. Right? So, uh, Wilson, President Wilson had a, a serious political problem on his hands um, when it became quite clear that uh, the United States was going to have to go to war with Germany, the Central Powers. Uh, he had won a second term um, predominantly by promising the American people that he would keep them out of the European War, um, which you know later becomes known as World War One. Uh, that war was quite horrific, and people were downright scared about what was happening over there. This was a truly um, one of the first industrial wars. So new technologies are being tried out. You got the use of mustard gas, the use of uh, tanks, the use of airplanes. Um, and the casualties in these wars were absolutely horrific, right? So the American people, by and large, wanted nothing to do with this war. And uh, Wilson had promised them, the American people, that he would do whatever it took to keep us out of it. Well, for reasons uh, mentioned before, especially economic reasons, it looked like America had no choice but to go to war with Germany. So how to get the American people on board, right? Real, real important. You'd, uh, it's very difficult. It happens. But it's, it's very difficult when policymakers take their people to war when there is um, minimal or at least divided support about the war. So we saw this in the latter part of the Vietnam War. We saw this um, as the war in Iraq um, got underway. Um, it, it becomes very difficult for um, political leaders to exercise a war effectively when the American people or whatever people we're talking about are on board. So any war that we're talking about, whether we're talking about ancient Rome or we're talking about wars in American history, you need to have uh, an effective propaganda machine in order to exercise that war without political ramifications on the home front. Um, so George Creel, a guy named George Creel, is, uh, is selected by um, President Wilson. George Creel, was, um, he's not well, really well known now, but he was very well known during his time. Uh, he was a muckraking journalist. Um, and so, um, 
And he was a, uh, a very uh, vocal supporter of uh, President Wilson. So it's no surprise that he was picked, and the American people didn't really have to get up to speed to get to know this guy, who would um, head what would be called the um, Committee of Correspondence. The, I mean, the Committee of uh, Public Information, the CPI, uh, Committee of Public Information. So the Committee of Public Information, which George Creel would head, um, was basically the institution that would affect uh, um, the propaganda machine um, to get American people on board. And some of the things that they um, used under the direction of George Creel uh, were programs like the Four Minute Men. They made the films, uh, certain films, and they had a, a very effective propaganda machine with a division of pictorial publicity. And we'll, we'll take a look at a little bit about this. I wanted just to talk a little bit about the Four Minute Men. Four Minute Men, what it was, uh, their first um, thing that they really had to persuade American people about was to get them to register for the draft. Um, it used to be after a war, um, America would scale down drastically after a war. This is off, um, off the advice of George Washington in his uh, farewell address, right? So there's a long tradition of scaling down. Like we, we don't, we haven't done that since uh, the end of World War II. But uh, it, it used to be quite a national effort for the um, if, if the United States wanted to go to war to get America up to speed. So first thing is to get enough men to, to fight a war, especially on this scale. So um, getting people to sign up for the draft was the first order of business for the Four Minute Men. And what the Four Minute Men basically was it was a utilization of a new medium that was sweeping the country. So any propagandist, um, effective propagandist knows you got to take the message where the people are, right? So where were the people at this time? Where were they congregating in mass? Movie theaters, right? So people are going to see these, this new thing called a movie. Or, um, uh, and so they're, they're going to check out um, these films and George Creel effectively got um, this program underway. There were thousands of speeches given by these so-called Four Minute Men. And what they would do is they would go into a theater and then they would give these very um, heroic and patriotic speeches talking about American values, patriotism, talking about the need to defeat the Huns, the Germans. Um, and people would get uh, really riled up at these things. In fact, a lot of people quit going to the movie theaters to see the movies. They wanted to see these really uh, incredible speeches. These speeches would be given, Four Minute Men would be um, known people within their communities. So they would be local businessmen, they could be pastors, uh, they could be veterans, they could be teachers. Um, so people would know them within the community. So people would want to go see them speak and give these really quick speeches, brief speeches, um, talking about American values, right? and the need for going to war. Um, they were very effective. Policymakers um, were very worried about um, instituting a draft. It was needed if they were going to go to war, but they were very worried about it. The last major uh, draft that was used was during the Civil War, and um, that wasn't a very... Um, um, th that wasn't a very great historical event, the draft. There was all sorts of draft riots, uh, and people very much didn't uh, enjoy being drafted, um, obviously. So Wilson was very, very concerned about, um, w about this. But the Four Minute Men took care of, of this quite a bit. There were also um, films that were made during this time um, depicting you know, American values. And these were very successful. They turned a profit, too. And so it's, it's very rarely that, an America, that a government program can turn a profit, but this one did. People went to go see these films, and so the, America, the U.S. government made a profit off of these films. The other thing that uh, we're quite actually familiar with, some of these images, um, comes out of the division of pictorial publicity. Um, so George Creel had this as well, and he got over... Um, um, he got about 1,500 works of art produced on this. One of the most famous uh, works of art was um, done by a guy named Charles Dana Gibson. And you've all seen this before. But uh, here's, um, here's Gibson's work, I Want You, 
right? Uncle Sam pointing his finger right at you. So if you don't do what this guy says, this guy means business, right? And so this is still an effective image. People use it all in all sorts of ways uh, for, uh, for, for all sorts of purposes. So imagine seeing this for the first time, people were inclined to at least look at it and wonder, well, what does this guy want from me, right? And what he wants is you to sign up for the draft, right? So it was, was quite effective. Um, other images would include um, Uncle Sam pulling up his sleeves to get ready to fight, defend your country. It's always good to have an eagle thrown in there somewhere. Uh, here's a businessman who's probably making lots of money on Wall Street, but he's not going to hang around. Um, he's not going to hang around um, and just think of himself. He's going to take off his jacket and go fight. The the caption on the headlines reads: "Huns kill women and children." Huns being Germans. Um, propaganda was used to get people to support um, to to buy bonds. Um, Propaganda would definitely, definitely a, a good use of propaganda is to go after male sense of um, masculinity. So you would have uh, women in, in these images wishing that they were men so they can go and fight. Grandma's even on board. So real effective images uh, during this. And there's just literally hundreds, thousands of these images that would post in, in most prominent places um, throughout the country. So. Quite effective. Americans uh, forgave, um, enough Americans at least, forgave uh, Wilson for his broken promise. But not enough, not enough. There were still dissenters during the war. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, you had dissent during the war. Um, many, many citizens still opposed this war. And so there were very uh, restrictive laws that were p passed at this time. Uh, the Espionage and Sedition Acts. Um, were, were the laws that were passed that restricted and imprisoned people for speaking out against the war. So basically, the restriction on civil liberties, um, together the Espionage and Sedition Acts of 1917, this is part of the, of the law, persons who commit the following act may be fined up to $10,000 or jailed up to 20 years, willfully causing insubordination, disloyalty, mutiny, and so on and so forth, right? You can be imprisoned and fined for these things. And a lot, a lot of people were. Um, uh, for, for, for doing such such this. Um, hundreds of people were imprisoned for doing this. A lot of people were imprisoned uh, were uh, union organizers, um, socialists, so, uh, and uh, German Americans. So there was a lot of cynicism of how this law was enforced, right? It, a, lot of, a lot of how this law was enforced was taking advantage of, uh, of it and kind of going after people that, uh, for political purposes, that had maybe something to do with the war, but had very little to do with it. Um, at any rate, um, it, it's, it's, it's quite disturbing that a lot of people were um, arrested during this time. Real famous case at this time um, was, in, in challenging the Espionage and uh, Sedition Acts, was a, a man named Schneck who was arrested for violating this act. And he, he claimed that his First Amendment rights were violated when he was arrested. And so he took um, the United States to the Supreme Court where he lost, right? And then, there we have this very famous ruling uh, by uh, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes when he outlined the court's opinion by explaining that when a, quote, clear and present danger existed, such as shouting fire in a crowded uh, theater, freedom of speech may be limited, right? And so um, he he served out um, his 20-year term, right? So many, many people received up to 10, 15, 20 years for um, encouraging people not to sign up for the draft, speaking out against the war, calling the war an imperialist war, um, and, and basically opposing Wilson um, in his efforts of taking the United States to war. So a very tragic part of American history, a very tragic part of uh, the suspension of civil liberties. So that's concept three um, of World War I. We'll come back later looking at uh, Wilson's peace settlement. So thank you very much, and I'll talk to you guys later.